Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Coelho. No subtitle? I was waiting for the subtitle. No Maybe subtitle. there isn't. I don't think there is. It. Yeah. I think when you sell 65 million copies, uh, you don't need it. You don't need it. And especially when you're talking about a book which was written by the soul of the universe, according to Paolo Coelho. <laughs> That's right. And it's all about Santiago. He's a young shepherd boy from Andalusia. He uh, begins the book as a simple sheep herder, but he's also an ambitious explorer. He's content with his life, but at the same time, he's wanting to. Uh, he, he keeps having these dreams about the Egyptian pyramids, and he feels pulled towards the pyramids. I mean, we've all got these dreams. They're pretty weird when you go to sleep and weird things happen. But for him, there was something weird about this one about the pyramids. It was like speaking to him um, almost as if it was like a personal, personal legend, so you know, a literal dream, but perhaps a metaphorical dream about how he should live his life. And he had this sense that like going to the pyramids was the whole reason for his existence. But you can't really be, no, for sure though, at that stage, can you? He's having a dream. That's right. I don't know. If I had a dream about the pyramids, I don't know if I'd uh, Go to Egypt. ditch my sheep and uh, get on the next boat. But uh, he just, he, he had this strong feeling. He had this feeling it was his personal legend. Uh, he felt that the pyramids were the whole reason for his existence. So I suppose if you have that strong of a feeling, you probably do pack up and... And set sail. Which he did, man. He, he went sail and he decided to go for it. He thought, look, I, want, I'm, I am an ambitious explorer. I'm pretty comfortable where I am now, but I want to go out there, see the field, see the countryside. And being a young lad, he wanted to see the place where the women were most beautiful. That's right. He thought uh, the women around his, his local town weren't doing it for him. So he wanted a bit more, something a bit more exotic. And so he headed off. Santiago, he learnt on his journey that it's the possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting. And he noticed as soon as he was out on his own on the journey, he had this sense of freedom and happiness that he had never really had before, even though he no longer had that, that security. And he was assured by others at the very start of his journey, look, when you really want something, the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. As he headed off on his journey, the first person he came across to help him on this journey was this old, an old woman. Uh, she led him back to a room at the back of her house. It was uh, separated off by a curtain with coloured beads. <laughs> <laughs> You've ever been to one of those rooms, Jonesy? The, the back curtain out the back. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> There you go, eh? So she's a bit of a cougar, this one. Often, it's often what happens when you're on an international trip, isn't it? A lady escorts you to the back we behind a curtain. We're virtually here, eh? No, this is a... <laughs> oh. Well, what she... Well, it's happened to all of us, mate. They t- share hands, they grab, grab each other's hands and they begin to pray. That's right. <laughs> oh, exactly. So she grabbed his hands, his, uh, his hands, and she thought, look, Looked at his palms, so she was a bit of a what do they call him? A bit of a um, mystique sort of lady. Yeah, there's a book coming up. She could, the cold reading book there coming up go. in a couple of months. There you that go. She, we'll she might out. have learnt from. Yeah, well, she learnt a lot from that one, and she said, "Very interesting. Look, Santiago, dreams are the language of God, and when He speaks in our language, I can interpret what God says. But when He speaks in the language of the soul, it's only you who can understand. But whichever it is." I'm going to pay, you have to pay me for the <laughs> consultation. That's right. She said, well, if it's a dream. It's only you can work that out, but I've done my job, so fork it over. But anyway, he said, I've had this, I had this dream twice. And he said, I dreamt that I was in the field with my sheep when a child appeared and played with the animals. And, <laughs> and suddenly, you know, this child it took him by the hands and uh, they just were transported to the Egyptian pyramids. And then at the pyramids, the child, once they'd got there, said, if you come here, you will find a hidden treasure. He said this dream twice, so it must be something. So the gypsy woman had a reaction to this. She went silent for the first time. Look, I'm not going to charge you anything now, but if you go to the, the, the pyramids, you got to give me one-tenth of whatever you find. And um, the boy sort of laughed at his happiness. He, at this stage, he wasn't certain he was going to find anything in the Egyptian pyramid, so he just thought he was just saving that consultation fee. <laughs> but obviously, the gypsy woman, she saw something in this dream and, and sort of was cracking an awesome deal, right? Yeah. Well, he said, okay, sure thing. I'll give you 10%. If you can interpret this dream and tell me what it means, I'll give you 10%. And she said, you know what? This is what the dream means. The dream means 
you need to go to the pyramids and dig up that hidden treasure. <laughs> Quite a literal yeah. <laughs> interpretation of that dream. Yeah. Not a metaphorical one. And so you thought, oh, I probably could have worked that out myself, yeah. but there goes 10% of potential winnings. Yeah, exactly. You thought, all right, that was pretty stupid. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go in the market and get some tucker. And um, yeah, he went down and got some tucker and he's sort of sitting down with all his thoughts and going, what am I doing? What am I doing a bit? And this old bloke was just, just sitting next to him and he just started asking him questions. So, Sandy, I started reading his book and this old annoying lad would just kept just asking him and just prodding him. It was pretty annoying. Eventually, Santiago, he took the bait and he said, well, what's that book you're reading? He says, well, this book says the same thing as all the other books says. It describes the inability to choose your own personal legends. And Santiago is starting to think, well, why is everyone talking about personal <laughs> legends all of a sudden? Um, this book also says that everyone out there, they, they go out there believing the world's greatest lie that at some certain point in our lives, we lose control of what is happening to us and our lives end up just being controlled by fate and it's the world's greatest lie. Yeah, the greatest lie that you can no longer control what's happening to you and then all of a sudden, this old sort of homeless looking bloke with an old scraggly beard and pretty torn up clothing, he said, I'm the king. I'm the king of Salem. And he said, well, that doesn't sound right. You yeah, don't really right. look like a king, any kings that I've seen. And he said, why the, why the hell would a king be speaking to a little simple shepherd boy like me? Well, he said, look, good question. I get this all the time. But most <laughs> importantly, really what you've done is you've, you've succeeded in discovering what your personal legend is. And the boy was just, he still didn't know what he was on about. And your personal legend is what you've always wanted to accomplish. And everyone, when they're young, they know what their personal legend is. Everything's clear. Everything's possible. You're not afraid to dream. You're, you're yearning for everything that could possibly happen in your life. But of course, as time passes, a mysterious force begins to convince people that it's going to be impossible to realize their personal legend. The force, it seems to be a bit of a negative force. It seems to keep popping up obstacles on this path. You think, okay, well, if, if I've got this personal legend, why are there all these other signs trying to block me or trying to send me down a different direction? Maybe this is not where I should be headed after all. But for everybody out there, um, there is a personal legend out there and whatever you do, the universe sort of wants you to, to go and figure it out and it's going to actually try and help you on the way. It doesn't matter what it might be. For some, it might be going out there and traveling. For others, it might be marry the daughter of a textile merchant or even searching treasure for like you, Santiago. Because this soul of the world, it's nourished by people's happiness and it's even nourished by unhappiness, envy or jealousy. Then the old man, he points to the baker and has a bit of a chuckle and says, Everyone always just points to a baker or something. I think yeah, Rich Dad Poor Dad was the same <laughs> yeah. on it. He says, look at that baker. When he was a child like you, he also wanted to travel. He also wanted to go to uh, lands far and wide. He also wanted to go and uh, go and uncover some hidden treasure. But you know what he said? He decided first to buy his bakery, put his money aside. And then he said, you know, when I get older, that's when I'll sell up and I'll take my money and go and visit Africa and go and travel. And of course... He's still running that bakery. Still running the bakery. He That lad over there, he never realized that people are really capable of a lot of great things at any of their life and you're able to do anything you can dream of really. And over the long run, what people think about shepherds and owning a bakery and being a respected baker and all that, that actually becomes more important than what their own personal legend is. It's a bit of a shame. And you know why I'm telling you this? Because you, Sandio, you're about to just give up on your personal legend, mate. You're just about to throw it all away, aren't you? That's right. And then the boy says, well, is that when this mystical king mysterious pops along and just gives him a little prod back in the, in the right direction just to save us from heading off uh, and giving up on our personal legend? He said, yeah, well, you know, yes. Not, all, <laughs> not always in this way, but some way or another, I'm, I'm always going to be there at yeah. this moment. Might be a solution or I might come here and throw you a good idea or something, but it's always a crucial moment and at that moment, you got the, you got the time to make a call and, and if you're going to go have a crack at this or not. People learn early in their lives what their reason is for being, uh, but sometimes if they learn too early, they also give up too early too, but that's kind of the way it is. In order to find the treasure, you'll have to discover these kind of omens like the old king in the market that pops up. Uh, they're all out there. Sometimes you're going to miss them. Uh, there's a path sort of prepared for you. Sometimes they're obstacles, but really they're omens. Uh, all you have to do is read the omens that pop up and continue on your journey. The boy, of course, he continued on his journey and he made his way to Africa. Getting a bit pretty close to the pyramids now. 
A lot closer than he was before, yeah. A lot closer. So he got there and again, he went to a bar to order a beer, um, have a sit. They spoke a different language. So he was pretty nervous at this bar. There was a few interesting looking old people around him. Um, and the bartender gave him this shitty old tea when he ordered a, a nice lager beer. So he wasn't really happy with that, but who cares? He's here to figure out what his treasure's doing. That's right. He's, he's taken this first big step on his journey. He sold up his sheep. He left the comfort and safety. He's in a foreign land, a foreign language, doesn't know anybody. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. Thankfully, an omen or a seeming omen popped up and a bloke who came over speaking his language and he says, hey, I'm going to help you here. Oh, you say you want to get to the pyramids, eh? Well, there's really only one way to get to the pyramids is we're going to need a couple of camels. So give me hand over your money. I'll go and deal with the bazaar, uh, you know, the bloke selling the camels and, uh, and let's go for it. And he said, yeah, we'll get there tomorrow. Easy. Yeah, fantastic. Easy. <laughs> Easy done. So big Santiago opens up the wallet, hands over all his cash and says, yeah. perfect, I'm on my way. Yeah. Oh, God, sounds like my mum's keto um, <laughs> keto beans she bought on the internet where you eat them at night and you, uh, and you lose weight the next day or oh, something. That sounds awesome. There's plenty of people like that. But he did that and then the guy took the money and ran off and then what do you know? He's <laughs> lost in the crowd. Oh, far out. He just disappeared. Oh, God, surprise, surprise. So Santiago is calling out. He's calling out. Where's, where, where's where my money? He? Where'd you go? Where's just my think, mate? At first, he's thinking, oh, that's just an innocent. You know, he'll, he'll come back soon with the camels. He's just waiting, waiting, waiting. All of a sudden, the shops start packing up, and uh, by the end of the night, it's getting dark. Santiago is the only bloke left in the market. No camels, no money, no nothing. shelter, man. <laughs> Homeless, cold, and about to cry. He was so ashamed. He was thinking, "What? What the hell am I doing? This is the stupidest thing ever. Why follow my dream? Is this what God does to 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 those who are trying to believe in their dreams? I could just be home, snug in bed right now, lying next to my sheep. He really loved his sheep, quite literally." Got up to funny stuff, maybe, but he was thinking oh, I could have been back there. That's right. He was uh, set off on this amazing new adventure, and he found himself the poor victim of the thief. No money, no connections, can't speak to anyone. Is an adventurer looking for treasure, and now he's just got nothing. And really, now he had another choice again. So there's there's a lot of times where a choice comes up in this book, and each have different stakes when they come. But again, he had this moment. Can I go back to comfort and security or despite losing everything I've got, should I just keep moving forward anyway and just seeing what happens in the pursuit of my dream? That's right. It's either a, an obstacle or an omen. He took the omen path and thought, you know, I'm not just going to give up now as much as he wanted to. He thought, okay, I'm going to keep forging ahead. I'm going to find some way around this obstacle to keep going. He decided he could see himself as a poor victim of a thief or an adventurer looking for treasure uh, on a quest and that's what he said um, I'm going to do myself and you know I realized I'm learning things along the way I'm getting better as I go I've learned to understand lang- some languages without words I've started to learn about omens maybe I can keep on moving and so he did and uh, his next step along the way was finding a crystal merchant shop um, on the top of a hill yeah, he found this crystal merchant and had been in the same shop for 30 years there was few people pass by and buy crystal every now and then. You wouldn't say it was thriving. Uh, it, the business kind of dropped off a bit. So Santiago went in there and said, look, how can I help? He said, I'll clean glasses in the window if you just give me something to eat and give me a little bit of coin to maybe help me on my journey. I'll work dawn till dusk. I'll work day and night. It's going to be the, the cleanest this crystal has ever been. The shopkeeper said, oh, come on, mate. I'll just give you... It sounds like you had a rough trot. I'll just give you the money you need to get back to go back home, but he said, "No, I'm I'm committed to this. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, revolutionize your business and revolutionize myself in the process." So the boy went hard. It um it took him a fair while, man. He was he'd been working hard for almost a month. He got through the whole shop. He started proactively adding things to the store to make it a better business, and, and that's what, exactly what happened. The business started to thrive. Santiago started getting a better cut of all the action he sold on for every piece. So he started being in the position where he's starting to get a bit of coin banked up and putting money aside and he started doing the math and he thought, all right, look, if I um, keep on saving, I could actually buy a whole bunch of sheep at the end of the year or obviously I could actually go the other way and um, go and continue on my journey. So over time, you know, he'd been working there for a month, two months, six months, things were picking up for the business, things were picking up for himself, the foreign city that he was in didn't seem so strange after all once he got a little bit comfortable. He remembered the words of the old king. When you want something, all the universe conspires to help you achieve it. 
He thought that even though he'd been robbed, he was in the middle of the desert, didn't know anything, didn't know anybody. It seems like things were actually kind of turning out all right for him. Yeah, he sort of forgot to mention all these big hiccups along the way. But at this stage, he's never been better in his life. Maybe it's good to be a bit like this crystal merchant. Um, on one stand, you're, you're, you're not chasing your personal legend, but you've learned a fair bit at this stage and you're doing it pretty good and you're pretty comfortable. But on the other hand, maybe he'll never actually get the shot again to have a crack at these Egyptian pyramids, which is, again, a pretty arbitrary dream, which you can't be 100% certain there's going to be something there. He had a couple of safe paths ahead of him. One was that he'd, he'd saved up enough dosh to get back home, get back to his sheep, go back to the comfort and safety of what he knew. Another safe path would be to stick around this crystal place because it really picked up and he was involved now in a pretty handy business. Uh, both pretty safe and comfortable paths. Neither of them were his personal legend of the pyramids. So what does he do? It wouldn't be a story if he just stuck around at the, at the crystal or if he went back home, would it? So, of course, he uh, said thanks to the crystal merchant for giving him a bit of a start, but now I'm off to the pyramids. Boom. He still had doubts about the decision he made and every decision along the way, but he'd learned by now one thing. Decision's just the beginning of things. When you decide something into your life, what happens is this real strong current of other forces that carry you to places that you never really dreamed of at the start when you first made the decision and actually where you end up. For example, like when he said, oh, hey, I'm going to go to the Egyptian pyramids, never he really thought he'd actually end up being a successful crystal shop merchant or anything <laughs> like that, or let alone be where he is right now, which is joining this big caravan um, going through the desert on, the, on seeking through his mission. He found that the, each step he got closer to realizing his personal legend, the more that personal legend became his true reason for being. It was kind of a bit of confirmation bias. Maybe he just got more and more confident that he was on the right track. I suppose he got pretty heavily invested, a fair bit of sunk costs involved, but he just, he just felt that, you know, I'm, on, I'm at least on the right track here. And on his trip, he met this uh, Englishman, and the Englishman was also following his own personal legend. He was studying the books so pretty strange it was a weird thing this englishman was doing but apparently his personal legend was to study all these books to find the one secret he was looking for the philosopher's stone not the harry potter that was the first harry potter book wasn't it it i think it is it's oh, it pretty is. it's uh it is the philosopher's stone the first book and it's a pretty good stone man it really is i think it's a different one in the harry potter one but this one you basically use it you can discern anything um into gold. You can get that, that bookshelf over there turned into gold and then gold's good, man. Oh, yeah. It's gold's pretty, good. If you've got this philosopher's stone, you can turn anything into gold. I think you've you, you kind of got it made, don't you? But it's pretty hard to get that philosopher's stone because mm. if everyone had a philosopher's stone and could turn everything into gold, then gold would be pretty boring and pretty useless, wouldn't it? That's right. That's right. So alchemy is a cool profession in that sense, but it's not just a metaphorical thing. A true version of alchemy really does exist. Most people out there don't really understand or experience how it works. Alchemy, in reality, it's really about discovering the treasure that has been reserved for each one of us. So mm -hmm. to make literal gold, crazy scientists lock themselves up in a lab and throw materials together and reactions to do so. Um, in, in doing so, you might try to find cheap metals into pure gold. There's a few mistakes that people make when they're trying to make gold. Yeah, in a literal sense, they try to make that one big leap from a crappy aluminium can that you just drank your coke out of and turn that into gold it's not quite how it works there are a few steps along the way uh that base metal needs to uh go maybe to a bit of lead and then to a bit of bronze and then to a bit of silver and eventually becoming gold you don't just go do it all in one heap similarly in this metaphorical alchemy that we're talking about transforming ourselves from some cheap useless base metal into uh gold by uncovering our own personal treasure Probably a few steps of evolution along the way as well. 100%. People sort of cheat it to try and just get to gold straight away, but it doesn't really um, work like that unless you're the guy who just stole all his money at the, um, <laughs> at the, at the market, which happened a bit earlier. But for Santiago, right, he, he had those evolutions along the way. He had those um, big belly of the whale moments and learned from it and grew to it. And probably in each step, he had progress a step of evolution along his journey to reach his personal legend. And, you know, personal legend is synonymous with the gold hero you could say that's right so he's, he's sort of evolved from that uh young shepherd boy he evolved next to a bit of a 
I don't know if it was, maybe it was probably backward step being a bit of a loser and losing all his money and in this strange place. But through the the, the risks, the heat and the pressure, I guess, of going to a new environment, uh, it kind of made him work for it. He evolved into that crystal merchant effectively that he'd learned a whole bunch of skills in, in life and in business. He'd made the next step, then he headed out on this next adventure. He was doing pretty well. He was evolving along the way out with his caravan heading down the camels and they came across an oasis. He also kind of did pretty well there as well. Well, this is where he was killing it, man. This next step along the way, he uh, had the, one of the best jobs. He was like, because he could read omens so well, he warned everyone of a, an incoming tribe coming to, to kill them all and he stopped them with that. And because of that, he became the counselor of the tribe, got paid shit tons of money. The hot lady in the, uh, the hot desert lady was pretty attracted to him. So Was that the chief's daughter or something? Something like oh, that. So, you got, you got the chief's daughter. Everything's going on pretty well. You know, he's absolutely killing it now um, and he's probably more successful than everyone. But right now, uh, do I continue on? And you could say it's almost requires equal courage, right? Like at the very start when you've got nothing to continue on because, you know, you could go back to comfort or continue mm-hmm. on. But now you actually, you've got absolutely everything, but you're continuing on. So, you're sort of losing all that potentially. So, oh, equally- I'd, say, I'd say it requires a lot more boldness. When you've got nothing, it's kind of easy to keep going, I guess. But when you... You got the hot wife, you got the good job, you got plenty of money rolling in, you're basically the big dog of this oasis, everybody's looking up to you. There's a lot more you can lose by giving up on it all and hoping to go find something more at the pyramids. So again, you faced the, the big choice. Um, the one night, you know, strolling through the desert, pondering, what the hell do I do? I've, I've only got one crack at the um one crack at going to see these pyramids, then all of a sudden this whoosh just <laughs> Wild shit started happening, and <laughs> this this, uh, this lad just popped up on a horse, and he was this wild, wild man, and he knew what was up straight away. Since yeah, hey, you're the alchemist, aren't you? Mate? And he goes, "Yep, got me. I'm the alchemist." <laughs> Conversation didn't go like that. It was a bit more epic, but it's anyway, he epic, found yeah. found the uh, the alchemist man. He had his Englishman mate who was trying to become an alchemist, but now he's actually met the real alchemist. He was yeah. dressed in a black cape. He had a falcon on his shoulder. He was on a big white horse. Just by looking at it, you know that that's an alchemist. Yeah. <laughs> And the alchemist gave him the advice again, a bit like the old King of Salem. Probably, all, I don't know how many alchemists there are in this book, but the King of Salem is a bit of an alco. <laughs> but um, he said, look, a bit like the baker merchant, I, but I know what's going to happen to you. If you don't go after it now, um, what's going to happen is clearly you've got enough cash now to go out there and buy sheep and camels. Clearly, you can marry Fatima, that missus, and you're going to be pretty happy for a year. You're gonna learn. You're gonna love the desert. You're gonna love this joint. Um, you're gonna know all the palms here, but you're gonna watch as they grow, and you're gonna have a better understanding of the desert. And he's like, "Hey, it's pretty good. I'm probably gonna stay around yeah. here." Yeah. He said, "Sometime during the second year, you're gonna remember this treasure, and the omens they're gonna keep pushing on your leg, tugging on your shoulders, and everything like that. And you're gonna keep trying to ignore it because you're not going for it." In the third year, all of a sudden your girlfriend's going to be a bit unhappy because she's going to feel like she's the reason that you stopped going for it on your quest um, and there'll be a lot more days now. You'll be walking the sands of the desert thinking, shit, maybe I should have gone for it and sometime in the fourth year, that's when things really turn back. So, those omens that um, have made you so successful now, they're going to abandon you and you know, fair enough because you've stopped listening to the omens. And you'll be dismissed then as your position of the tribal counselor because you can't read the desert and know things. But, you know, in one sense, you can be pretty rich. You can have lots of camels, which is pretty cool. But you're going to spend the rest of your days knowing that you didn't pursue your personal legend. And now it's too late. You've missed the boat. It's a fair whack from the alchemist, isn't it? Ooh. It sounds all nice and rosy the first year or two and then things really take a sour turn. But it's really a message for all of us. There's something deep within us urging us to pursue... Uh, our own personal legends by constantly moving forward, not staying safe and staying comfortable and taking a, f- a few risks to boldly take that next step. Uh, you need to you know, build up the kahunas to go for what you really want. The universe will conspire to help you along the way. A few obstacles in the way, a few omens coming your way as well. Sometimes the things that look like obstacles are actually going to help you. Sometimes the things that look like shortcuts, like the bloke coming to buy your camels for you, are actually going to be setbacks. But over time, you've got to really keep going for it. If you decide to uh, stand still and say, yep, no, this is about where I want to stop, suddenly those omens are going to stop appearing. The personal legend is going to be some distant echo in the background. Yeah, that sounds pretty brutal. One of the things about alchemy is when you get these pretty high sort of base metals and get a little bit bits of gold and you're sort of following your personal legend, you can sort of connect with your soul 
and connect with your heart much better so you can understand what your sort of heart is trying to say. For Santiago, he was pretty good at this. He got pretty good at, at this and he actually could have a direct conversation with his heart and most of us, when we speak to our heart, it just you're probably not going to hear much back. Santiago, he had a pretty interesting convo. We all have these weird senses. For Santiago, it was a couple of dreams about the pyramids. Uh, for you, it might be not quite so literal, something maybe a little bit metaphorical coming from a dream or coming from something deep inside you, tugging at you, knowing that you know what you should be doing. Uh, you're probably afraid to do it at first. We can kind of decide to palm these off like it's nothing or we can choose to actually stop and listen. Yeah, man. It's uh, He says it's the, really the one instrument that actually knows deep down what your dreams really are and about the ways you can actually go after them. So, if you're not using that instrument, then you're not really knowing what your dreams are. Um, for Santiago, he said, all right, I'm going to listen to my heart. I'm going to use this instrument that she's actually pointing me in the direction I should be. And when he did listen to it with his conversation, he found the advice that hearts have about the nature of dreams, not just for him, but really for anybody. Everyone on earth has a treasure inside that awaits them. Our hearts don't really say much about the treasure because the heart kind of knows that you're not going to listen. Hearts, they kind of speak to children. They tell children, they guide them to say, hey, this is what you should be doing. Uh, If you listen, it's going to keep chirping away. But if you kind of push it back to the side, it's going to maybe eventually try a little bit more and then it's going to try less and less and less. Eventually, once the heart knows you're no longer listening to it, it's going to go silent altogether. Yeah, and out there, people are afraid to pursue the most important dreams because they feel that they don't deserve them or that they're going to be unable to go out there and achieve them. So, as a heart, we're pretty fearful of treasures and that are uh, hidden forever in the sands because when you actually don't go for it, our hearts suffer terribly and that's really what's going on in this world. Santiago, he made the pact to never let his heart go quiet. He made the pact to always listen to that heart so that it would keep speaking to him. He knew that if he ever sort of strayed Away from pursuing his dream, his heart was going to sound the alarm and put him back on the right course. So he knew that he always had to heed the message of the heart. And of course, by listening to this, by listening to the alchemist and listening to his heart, bad luck Fatima, he dumped her, he moved on. We came back to her. He he came back to her. For now, he said, said, I'm off. I've got to continue my journey. I've got to leave my cushy job, my nice paycheck, and I'm off to the pyramids. Now, The Alchemist is a pretty weird book, um, but really deep within it is is a, is a good message for all of us. Like For Paolo, he said it only took him two weeks to write this book and um, at the very start, it sold no copies and then ended up selling 65 million copies. And he said, the only reason I could write that fast is because the book was already written in my soul um, and it just poured out of him. I reckon he probably could have taken another couple of weeks to tighten it up a bit. <laughs> Maybe go for a second or third draft, but hey, it sold 65 million copies, so it must be all right. Yeah, I think it's an insanely uh, good book, man. Of course, Santiago, the, the crux of the book is it's not just about reaching the pyramids, all about the, the evolution that he went through and this, the journey along the way. And there's lessons that we can all take from it. So number one, we've all got a personal legend um, that we're going to be happier, more abundant and a less burdensome life if we fulfill it. Secondly, there'll be fear that will hold us back. We'll constantly have moments where we have to decide whether to follow our heart in the direction of our personal legend or if we just say, no, nah, heart, can you stay quiet for a bit? It's nice and comfortable here. I'm just going to hang out and chill out. And of course, finally, there's no shortcut to becoming gold. Every time we need to take the necessary steps with the required courage and a different form of courage sometimes that are on the way to transformation. Mm-hmm.